Bless you, Sister Turner. Yeah. Jump right out of that bed and come on. <laughs> All right, I'll turn the service over to Brother Jackson. Thank you, Brother Allen. You may be seated this morning. God bless every one of you. I want to greet each and every one of you today. I thank the Lord today that he has allowed me in life to see some things that lets us know we're living just before the end. Here's a magazine sent to me free by somebody. I know I say a lot about education, but please, I'm not against a good education. But I can prove to you now that our colleges today are not teaching what they did 60 years ago. All the mythology of the ancient people are now taught Harvard, Yale, and other top universities have these courses to offer you. You can study them in your home, or they're on tape, you can play them in your cars. It gives you the lectures, the philosophers that teach these in our colleges. So don't, when I stand up here and make a remark, don't think I'm lying. Somewhere in the back of my files, I got something other to prove it. If I wanted to study mythology, all I have to do is to go upstairs and get the books of the first and second century of Christendom. And in there, brothers and sisters, is the controversy of many of the ancient Greeks that was converted, so st supposed to be, to Christianity and how they begin to mix the revelation with a lot of the mythology that went on back then. And some of that is held on right in Roman Catholicism. That's why they have certain personalities by the name of the apostles. If you're sick, pray to that one. That did not come out of the Bible. It come out of ancient mythology. Greeks, ancient Romans, all of that. I have to say, what good is it going to know you in life? How to make a decent living? How to be a good father or to be a good mother? And to bring your children up in the ways of simple, practical living. And to know all of that ancient junk. Just the first part of this week, I saw a young man. He made a very bold statement. Too many religious people were bigoted. I thought to myself, You are a stupid character. My Bible tells me there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, if I'm bigoted, I'll be a bigoted. Then I saw another article in another magazine I take. Another man is saying... Islam is a peaceful religion. It's just as a few radicals that cause all of this terrorism. Well then, Mr. Wise Guy, let me ask you. How come if they're all so peaceful, it started out in one mother country, Saudi Arabia. 
How come then in the 8th century it swept all the way across North Africa if it's a peaceful religion? Who did all this conquering? Then when I read the histories, when they come up through the Holy Land and they engage the Crusaders, which was there to drive them out, Finally, the Islams overcome them, and they did not stop. By the time we get into the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th century, they've taken over all the regions where the Greek Orthodox Church was at. And that's why we've got troops in Bosnia today. That warfare was not a warfare of politics. It was a warfare of religion against religion. And I have to say this morning, brothers and sisters, Go on, get a good education. But when you come out of that institution, be sure you know how to earn an honest dollar. Be sure that you know how to walk and talk with a man and deal with a man and treat him as a, a decent human being. For I have to say, knowing all of this junk, and I saw this morning how in some of our high places of learning, now that they're wanting to teach our younger students the high realm of science. Well, I'm not against certain areas of science, but when you have to start learning, mothers and sisters, what the rocks on the moon was made out of, and you forget how to say yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, down here, you have lost your place as far as I'm concerned. Now, I don't mean to be smart, but I'll have to say, the world you live in has become anti-God. No wonder Jesus says in the St. John's Gospel, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? No. That's why the nations of the world will want to fight him. Amen. Wonder he's coming with his bride, I have to say. No wonder then he will smite the earth with the sword that goes out of his mouth. Amen. And the dead bodies will lie. And Mr. Smart Man, you're going to lie there one day and your carcass is going to stink. And he'll call for the vultures and the beasts of the field to come and devour their flesh. Come and eat flesh till you be filled. Drink blood till you be drunk. For this is the supper of the great God. Am I bigoted? I believe talking about something other than I know what I'm talking about. Now then, if you have your Bible, turn with me this morning back in the book of Revelations. We're on the subject of the seals, and I want to show you, brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, these seals, <clears throat> that we're talking about, on the scroll right here, but here it is, this scroll, brothers and sisters, has been in the hand of of Jesus sitting on the throne of God during 2,000 years of mediatorial interceding for the names contained in the scroll. Now, we've, we've got this time broke up more or less pretty well equalized. But really this time factor, brothers and sisters, is not that a way when we begin to read the scriptural and the historical outline of it. Because... This is a 2,000 year period all the way through. But we could say we could move this back here about like this. And then we could pull this one back up here, brothers and sisters. And this dark age period, that black horse rider, which was the third seal, that's the seal, brothers and sisters, that shows the Antichrist ruling, reigning, in supposed to be Christianity in the world for better than a thousand years. That's why I said last Sunday. This spirit of Antichrist did not all of a sudden jump from a white horse rider to a red horse rider. The red horse rider was how the Roman Empire began to see the rise of Christendom. And they looked at it as a fearful thing that the Christians would arise and begin to rebel against. So the Romans, they set about a bloodbath. 
But the more they bloodbath the Christians, it seems as though God gave the Christians grace to die. And to see the Christians die, the spectators sitting in the bleachers many times only wanted to die along with them. Now that's in the early Antonicean Fathers. I say these things this morning. That's why these heads up here represent how the power and the Spirit of God work through what we see the animal as a symbol of, how it works through to earth to, we will say, give the Christians the boldness, the courage, the determination to be willing to offer their lives as a testimony of the faith. Instead of thousands of them going to arenas crying and begging, they went to the arenas singing and rejoicing. That is known also in history. Now then, brothers and sisters, when we do come to this black horse rider, that covers a long period of time. And as I read last Sunday, that's where the, the whole practical, whole gospel of the Christ has now been changed into a tradition, into rituals. They take the Mass and they break it down. And they do certain things with it. That's none other than the Lord's Supper. Just a simple thing that early Christians did. And it was sort of like drinking a toast. You've seen certain political figures. They'll drink a toast in memory of a certain official. Haven't you? Well, brothers and sisters, when the Lord Jesus took the, the bread and the, the cup, He was not introducing to them how to actually fulfill a, a feast supper. We find Paul getting after the Corinthians for doing that, don't we? So then what did Jesus do? He took the elements as a symbol. And as they partook of the bread, not a great big hunk of it, but a little crumb of it, they do it in remembrance. So it's, they're partaking of a toast. If you understand what I mean. In memory of Jesus, who was the one that gave his life for you and me. Likewise, they took the cup. It's not the Christians having a feast, drinking a whole cup of wine, but it's taking a sip in memory of the blood that he was willing to shed as a means of an atonement for you and me. Now, that's the best I could break it down. But in Catholicism, look what they made a, a ritual out of it. And it become a monetary gimmick. And it's went all over the world. And as I say these things this morning, I'm not pointing my finger at any Roman Catholic person in here. Because as many of you in here, you came out of the system. So I'm not pointing the finger to you because I got a lot of things to say to you about denominationalism today. What has denominationalism become to you? So if you listen carefully to what I'm saying, I hope that you can understand some things today. When we do get into where then the fourth beast says, come and see. Now I want to say this morning, when we read in the scriptures and we read in history, how that from 500 A.D., so actually we could push this time back long about in here somewhere. And we could push this time long up in here close to like that. Because this makes this dark black horse period a long period of here. When we see that, brothers and sisters, that black horse rider did not change the gospel in every detail the first year. Each year or each decade or a period of time by different popes, the thought came to do this or to do that. And I've got the, the book at home. And it's the book that was written by Roman Catholicism. And it tells the glories of the Mother Church. What she teaches, when she instituted it, and what was the basis and the reason? So my brothers and sisters, I have to say today, 
after we've come 2,000 years of the gospel grace age. We've come to the hour now. We're not living under the headship of the line. Nor this, nor this. We are living under this, the eagle. That's the symbol of that prophetic spirit of God that God would execute and show forth into the world, not to the presidents, not to the Senate and Congress, not to the mayors or the governors, but to His church. Not denominationalism, but through His true bride church people. That's the way we have to look at it. Now when, when this spirit of Catholicism began to get powerful, by the time we come to 500 AD, the Pope in Rome is now beginning to push himself as an instrument of authority. He's the little horn that Daniel saw coming up. He was small at first. But through each century, the very men that exercised in this horn, they watched their opportunity. They kept elevating their position. Because the history of the Roman Empire shows that in these decades that follow, the emperor of Rome, his position is getting weaker. Now we know this, that that imperial ship of the ancient Caesars was not established by God. It had been established by the devil. That's why that Roman system was so mean and dictatorial. But then, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> when the Antichrist spirit began to come into the church, its objection was to weaken it, gradually bringing it down to a carnal level, so then the spirit of Satan could begin to manipulate and raise up individual figures within the ranks of it to begin to push because the devil's main objective was eventually exalt the Pope so that the Pope one day will sit in the city of Rome not as the emperor but as complete supreme ruler over the political side, over the spiritual side. And it was a slow, gradual process. But it actually came about. So my brothers and sisters, I want to say this morning, <clears throat> when we do come then to 1500, God has through men give the Catholic Church a warning from within. As I said last Sunday night, here was Sweeney, Huss, Wycliffe, and those men. Before that, there was Savonarola and the poor man of Assisi, Assisi. I have to say, these men, they saw a little something about the system of Romanism that caused them to cry out, and the end of them was martyrdom. Now then, all of that was done under this. It's how God used the wisdom of men in the darkest hour of time to speak against this system of Rome, what they've done to the gospel. Now with this in mind, we do then come to the beginning of the Reformation. What was this Reformation for? It was God's way of sending a man with a revelation of the Scriptures, not in the entirety that's why, brothers and sisters, when we come to 15 and 20, there was a man by the name of Martin Luther. He was not a backwood preacher from the hills. He was already a priest, learned in the, well, we'll say, the scriptural interpretation, the way the Catholic system did it. But something in his heart made him feel bad. He felt a need. He felt a longing for God to speak to him. And brothers and sisters, he prayed. 
He studied the priesthood. He knew all the angles of Catholic theology. He still wasn't satisfied. But the beginning of his main testimony was one day when he was doing penance, after fasting, he was climbing these number of steps. And at the top of these steps was a statue of Mary. Brothers and sisters, in the 15th century, you've got to understand the revelation of the gospel, much of it has been lost. Catholicism gradually, slowly, has taken over and instituted creeds and the rituals of the gospel. So Martin Luther is doing what the tradition was. He's crawling up these steps that thousands before him had crawled. And as he reaches the top, and as he crawls to the feet of this statue, the feet of this statue have been kissed so many times. They've been worn almost away. And he's in this process when an audible voice echoes down to the corners of heaven. Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith. But he has been taught by the system and the priesthood. There is no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. That's in the cardinal teachings of them. With this sound of the voice of God, what does it do to Martin Luther? He returns to his living quarters. And the history says he locks himself away from society. And for days society didn't see him. They wonder what's going on with him. One day then, here he comes out of his quarters. And he has a long dark, uh, 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 document. So they all follow him. Down the street he goes. To the front of the church at Wittenberg, Germany. He steps upon the steps and he tacks up this document on the door. He turns to look at the people and said, Look. See what I've done. Here I stand. Ninety-five things he had wrote against the system of Catholicism. And brothers and sisters, <clears throat> it started a revival. As it started a revival, these words reached Rome. And they're going to try to call him in. Like they had done all the other men beforehand. But for some reason, the king of Germany says, Martin Luther, we will stand with you. So with the military arm of the German monarchy, monar Martin Luther was able to proclaim the beginning of the gospel afresh. That salvation first begins with faith in in the Lord Jesus, not in the system. Brothers and sisters, thousands of people over a period of time had forsook the clutches of Catholicism and embraced what Martin Luther said. When the, when the military might of Germany stood with him to rescue and we will say to protect him, this gave people boldness. Then it wasn't long, brothers and sisters, other men down the line. Here came Calvin. He too began to study the scriptures. He began to see, brothers and sisters, that once you're really saved and born again, you're not say, saved and born again a dozen times. There's no such thing. You're saved today, the lost tomorrow, and saved the next day, and lost the next day, and you have to be keeping this over. Then it wasn't long another man began to embrace the truth. He saw that the predestinated, the foreknowledge of God, he knew before the foundation of the world, he knew exactly everyone that would and would not. As we look at these different men that were used by God in the Reformation, 
we can say this. This was God's way of taking the sword of the Spirit and wounding the power of that head, that dictatorial head of Roman Catholicism. Do you understand? But then as time went on, we find we're in the book of Daniel. This little horn would exalt itself. And as it would exalt itself, it was centuries of time doing this. That in this centuries of time, he would succeed then in plucking up three horns. Now when you read the scriptures, it sounds like he literally just rushed over and just literally dethroned certain kings and destroyed their, their power. No, that's not the picture at all. What happened, brothers and sisters, when certain kings began to do certain things, it was then that the Pope began to come against those countries and weaken them. And there was three absolutely. I've got it all right here in history. I want to say, brothers and sisters, this history that I've got was written and copyrighted in 1917. When I first got a hold of this history, I said, the history in here, the writer is not even compiling it and quoting per verses of Scripture. He's writing history, laying it down in its chronological order, and yet you can almost see the prophecy side of Scripture being fulfilled the way time brought the development of it all brought about. Now, I brought it with me today, brothers and sisters, just to try to show you something. When we come to the Reformation, you're still moving under the headship of man. How many realize that? All your Reformers were men. And God used every last one of them. I'm saying that to say this, brothers and sisters. The book of Revelation is a unique letter of prophecy. I've illustrated it like this. It's like a love letter. John was given this letter and the words to say in it. He lived in 96 A.D. But please don't let 96 A.D. cloud your mind from how God used him. The first three chapters, brothers and sisters, as God shows to John on the Isle of Patmos, the seven churches of Asia, you see them recorded in the first three chapters. The conditions in those churches literally existed in the process of time. And that was the state, spiritually speaking, of those seven churches of Asia, which had been established by the Apostle Paul, as John was on the Isle of Patmos in 96 A.D. Keep in mind, the Roman Empire in 96 A.D. did not yet have seven heads, neither did it have ten horns, neither did the little horn show itself, and there was no woman riding it, as portrayed in the 17th chapter of Revelation. The reason I'm saying this this morning is, all through the Reformation period, God was doing something to restore to an element of people, stage by stage. Each one of these stages, from the Lutherans, they become a denomination, didn't they? Then the Calvinists, they were the Anabaptists that starts. They become a denomination. Then Knox, the Presbyterians, they become a denomination. Then here comes John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. They become a denomination. And out of all of this is all of our other denominations that we have today. Coming on down through time, look at Jehovah's Witness. Yes, they've got a truth. Denominations look at Jehovah's Witness. 
and almost wants to run them over with a shotgun. But let me say this. The, Je the Jehovah Witness saw back in the 1800s that there's an hour of time coming when Jesus Christ will come and he will establish a millennium reign on this earth. You try to teach that to the Methodists and they will say, we don't believe this stuff. But the sad part of it was, it was started by the International Bible Students, which eventually become your Jehovah Witness. And brothers and sisters, all they become today, brothers and sisters, they believe in the millennium reign and the second coming of Christ. But a born-again salvation filled with the Holy Ghost, that's not in their revelation. So I ask the question, where does that leave you at if you are a Jehovah Witness? I remember a few years ago, it's been about 20 years now. There's a little church down in Corden of Jehovah's Witness. This was one morning. <clears throat> I was in the barn doing something in the barn lot. This car pulled up. This young fellow got out. I seen he had some literature. I figured he was a Jehovah's Witness. So I walked up to him. I didn't tell him who I was or anything. I said, good morning. And he began to talk to me. Well, he says, I'm from the Jehovah Witness group here in Corden. And he says, I have some literature. He said, I'd like for you to take some of it. I said to him, I said, sir, I am a minister. I do not belong to a denomination. But I believe in the same things that you teach. You teach a millennium. I do too. You teach the second coming of Christ. I do too. But I teach other things that you don't teach and you won't teach. He said, well, what's that? I said, I believe that there's got to be a genuine new birth according to the scriptures and be filled with the Holy Ghost and I just got started explaining. And he just threw up his hands. Oh, we know all about that rotten stuff. Bingo like that. He just jumped in his car and took off. <laughs> so the point is, brothers and sisters, practically every denomination, no matter what its name is, today it's a closed door to further truth. Now I have a reason for saying that. Because, brothers and sisters, when we come on down to Seventh-day Adventists and all of them, God visited them with an essence of truth out of the Scriptures. And they would take this truth and they would build around that. And they would feel so secure in just that. But the sad part of it is, brothers and sisters, they organized their fellowship just around that very thing. Then they hold on to other anti-things, brothers and sisters, that mix them just like they are and all the rest. When I say that this morning, I've got the history of every last denomination on the face of this earth. What they teach, when they begin to change, what they've done. And that's why I say, brothers and sisters, all the era of the Reformation that was wounded that wounded the power of the papacy, as it's described in the scriptures, that was all done under this head. How many realize that? No divine revelation ever came down yet to begin to go back and expose the evils and the wrongs of the past. Sure, I've seen some of the writings of men in Methodism, <clears throat> Presbyterianism. They could write and tell you about how bad Catholicism was in its darkest hour. But then they leave their system like it's up high and dry and it's very virtuous. Brothers and sisters, all of that has been done under the inspiration of God through this. How many understands that? But then when we begin to come to the time, and I'll have to say, brothers and sisters, that begins to bring you within the last 100 years of time. 
God began to set things in motion <clears throat> and he began to prepare the stage when he would begin to speak to his people on earth through the head and the inspiration of the eagle. And may I say, no revelation out of the book of Revelation has ever came in any other period of time. Believe me, brothers and sisters, God kept it all for the end time bride. So now, <clears throat> I will say, the mother of the systems was Roman Catholicism. And the Reformation was a period of time where God tucked the sword, sword of the Spirit and using man in his brilliancy of learning and the inspiration God gives him, he would hit that system and out would come an element of people. On and on we go. But each move did not bring it to the original state of the early church. How many realize that? Now we've got to understand one thing, brothers and sisters, because if we don't, when we get to the hour we're living in now, look at the religious world out there. I ask you a simple question. Can you tell me really how spiritually they are? No, you can't. You can tell me, oh, how sincere they are. But do they have a revelation at all? No, sir. Because you try to present to them some of the things that you see, they shut the door of their understanding completely to it. Because they close themselves away from everything. Now the reason I say that, brothers and sisters, when we do come down into the hour of time we live in, I want you to take a good look at yourself. You are a people that's been dealt with by the Spirit of God to eventually become a part of the bride of Jesus Christ here in the end time. Not a denomination, but a potential bride people. You were not brought out of the systems by that of the headship of man. How many realize that? It's the inspiration of that of that prophetic eagle. And it started a few years back when God had a prophet messenger on earth. That's why he came just precisely as Malachi 4, 5, and 6 said. To turn the heart of the children in time back to the faith of the fathers. During his early days, brothers and sisters, there's not a denominational person that didn't hear about him somewhere. And I have to say, had they been sitting in them systems with a hunger in their heart, because that's what was going on in me. If there had been a hunger there, once they'd have heard about this man, they'd have broke their neck to get to hear him. Some did, but only to turn away. Well, I don't see anything of importance. It just goes to show, brothers and sisters, they did not have that deep dwelling spirit of God dealing in them to inspire them, to revelate them, and to show them really what they should do. This is why I have to say, all these denominations, brothers and sisters, has been in existence. When we come to the early beginnings of this 100 years, that's the only prophecy in the Bible that tells you that in the end time, and this is in Daniel 12. It plainly tells you. The wise will understand. Somebody please tell me. Who are these wise? Why did that prophet write that that way? Isaiah said nothing about it. But then when John saw this angelic being standing on the waters... And an angel here and an angel there. You read this in Daniel 12 in the latter verses of it. He begged that angel to ask him, What means these phenomena? Daniel was told him these words. It's sealed up. It's not for you to know. 
But Daniel was very persistent. It troubled his insides. And he begged. But what means this? And then the man on the waters, through that angelic being, told him exactly. The signs of the end time. And brothers and sisters, as we come on down to there, it gives you a natural background of society. Knowledge will be increased. Brother, if we're not living in a day when knowledge, the carnal side of knowledge, they can't stop. There's no end to it. But they've left God out. And that's why I have to say, what good is it going to do you if you miss God completely? Do you think your diploma in science or trigonometry is going to save you? It's not. It's only going to be your faith in the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to save you. And as we come to the close of that 12th chapter, think of it, 500 and some years before the advent of Christ, Daniel was told, the wise will understand. Understand what? The rocks on the moon? All about mythology? Brad, take a look out there. Everything that's mentioned in this book is going on. Every bit of it. You are the only people that potentially have an understanding and can say, I can see we're living in the last days. <clears throat> we would like to go to church today. They don't like to look like the old holiness of years ago. They like to look like this modern bunch of females. They got to let their breasts shine. Sisters, I'm not standing here to belittle you. Because I have spent time where they were completely naked. I saw more women at one time with their breasts all bare and open. As I've said many times. Seeing this kind of a scene every day for about two and a half months. Living among them. You get so tired of this kind of a scene. And how many GIs I heard say, be so glad to get back home where women wear clothes. Only to come home and look what has happened. Now they take them off. Now they've got to show their flesh. I have to say, this is the day that the devil is ruling the human race. He stripped them down. He making them bare naked. And then if you say anything, oh, you're one of them old bigoted Holy Ghost fellows, ain't you? Yes. I believe that when God come into the garden and Adam and Eve had hid themselves, he was not pleased to look at that little old apron of figs around their waist. He went and got sheepskin. Here, put that on. That was the beginning, brothers and sisters, of humanity supposed to clothe themselves. But I have to say, look at your denominational world. Look at them on TV. The other night I turned into a station. And brother, that auditorium was filled with thousands of people singing a religious song. And that song leader, he was really leading them. He was really heaping it up. But when I looked over that crowd, and I've seen them standing there with their jeans, with tattoos, and some of their hair pushed way up, and some of the ornamentation they had on, I thought, my God, what has the human race come to? And yet they're worshiping God. As I say this this morning, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Don't you think it ain't? You say, Brother Jackson, who gives you the authority to say these things? Let me ask you a simple question. When Jesus was telling his disciples in Matthew 24 and then come to 25, then, he was pointing to our day, then, Future tense, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened 
to five wise and five foolish. What did he mean by such an illustration? Did he literally mean that only five people are going to be saved? And five foolish are going to be lost? Why did he use such small percentages? He could have said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto 10,000 virgins, 5,000 wise and 5,000 foolish. Take it over, people. I want to ask you a question. Can you, in your mind, put together a figure? How many would you say in America? How many thousands in America are believing today the same thing you're believing? I don't believe it's in the thousands. I believe it's in the hundreds. Would you agree with me? Amen. When Jesus spoke that, <clears throat> he knew exactly what he was saying. So however small you see the figure today to be in America of the wise, then don't tell me that there's going to be 10 million foolish virgins. Oh, but from our carnal standpoint, we're going to... But I know some of those people, they're my uncles and aunts. Oh, you sweet little thing. And you can't teach them nothing. They don't want you to. Get away from me. Don't bother me. I know what I believe. Jesus also said this. In that day, He will send forth His angels and gather the tares what are the terrors, the pretenders, suppositional Christians, in bundles, in denominations, into large congregations? But don't teach them truth. They don't want to hear it. Why? Because they have no hunger. They're not beside their bed at night. Oh, Lord, lead me. Jesus promised this. How be it after the Holy Spirit has come? He, the Holy Spirit, will do what? He will lead you into all truth. He will teach you all things. And He will bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have spoken. So there's not a thing in that book that the Holy Spirit will overlook. So I'm saying this morning, now that we're living under the eagle hour, the voice of that eagle? Yes, there was people in the denominations heard about him. Knew about him. In 1963, when that man stood over here in his little tabernacle and preached those seals during that week, in 1965, after he had passed away, I was told by an important figure that knew. Tommy Osborne who God used as he was permitted in the early days to see Brother Branham in the healing ministry. Tommy Osborne sought the will of God and God began to honor him and his ministry in praying for the sick. He began to go in different places throughout the world. But the point to hurry it up, this person wanted Tommy Osborne to hear what Brother Branham said about the seals. He took these seal tapes and he went on a fast. And he fasted during the days that he was playing these seal tapes. When he has completed listening to them, he brought them back and gave them to the man that given to them and said, I want nothing to do with it. I can remember, brothers and sisters, at the tabernacle when the funeral was there. Because I had a little part to say. Tommy Osmond was sitting right behind me. His hair then was white. It wasn't long, brothers and sisters. It was long as my horse's tail. <laughs> and he dyed it. And it's been that way ever since. 
So I'm saying these things this morning, brothers and sisters, not to be arrogant or foolish. But you and I have been privileged to hear something. And brother, it behooves us. How will we take it? How will we honor it? What will it do inside of me? But when you look out there in the religious world, don't tell me they're all foolish virgins. They're not. There's no more foolish virgins out there than there are wise virgins ready to go in the rapture. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have used a parable. Jesus was a man that did not throw his words out there haphazardly. I have to say, a lot of that stuff we see going on out there, brothers and sisters, it's none other. They've been bound in bundles. No wonder they could go to these big auditoriums. And oh, how they can sing. Oh, how we love Jesus. Oh, how we love Jesus. And tears come down their cheeks. But they have no revelation how to present their bodies. They have no revelation as condemnation. When the Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, clean, and acceptable to God. So as I say these things this morning, I have to say... The Reformation today, brothers and sisters, the systems that was used by God, they had their day. But now every last one of them systems, as we come across the line and we're over here, them systems are dead. That's why the message came when it did. Because it was God's way of speaking to every religious system of Christendom. And God used the message to call them out. That's why some of us are ex-Catholics. Some of us are ex-Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians. God knew who he was getting. Amen. He knew who he was speaking to. And look what he's done with it. Now as I say this, brothers and sisters, then when we come to the years of 19 and 65, I'm thankful to God. Now is the time when God is really going to start speaking by this beast, that eagle, down here. And that's why, brothers and sisters, when Brother Branham stood over there in the tabernacle in 1963, during the last part of March and April, he preached those six seals, and he made them sound so unique. You could not help but see what they really was pointing to. And I have to say, but he did not bring a revelation on the seventh one at all. He just spoke of it. And I have to say that seventh one has not literally been broken so that it can unlock the contents in the revelation that's to take place. Now I want to say this this morning. <clears throat> A lot of people will say, well, Brother Jackson, don't you think you could be wrong in this and don't you think you could be wrong in that? I'm very thankful to God for the fact that he allowed me one day to come in possession I don't know where it came from. I really don't. Copyrighted in 1917. When I looked and began to read, I thought, the man that compiled that, he must have been a Christian. Yet there's not one thing referring to scriptures at all in this. I want to show you something other. I was told by a Methodist preacher one time when I preached on the second coming of Christ and I gave reference to certain scripture and revelation. He said, you know, he says many of us believe that the book of Revelation should have never been written. And in my young heart I thought, oh, how can you say that? 
I feel like that this book of Revelation was written strategically for a certain people right at the end time. Yes, for many days gone by, they would read this. And they said, well, it looks so mysterious. Nobody can understand it. But now then, I'll have to say, John, when he was shown the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, turn with me. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> anybody knows, in 96 A.D., when John was on the Isle of Patmos, and the book of Revelation was written, the Roman Empire had not yet evolved into the state of what we're going to read about. John could see the Roman Empire as what Daniel prophesied, coming up out of the waters, having this gigantic head, and how it began to devour and stamp under its feet the residue. Daniel saw it later, it had ten horns. But John lived when there was nothing like that in existence at all. So when he is told to write and he wrote the first three chapters. That was present tense. As John lived, and John had been in those churches, and there's no doubt, brothers and sisters, he could be a testimony and a witness of the fact that those conditions was literally going on right then. When he comes to that last church, we come to the fourth chapter. Notice then how the voice from above said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that shall be hereafter. Now that means way on in time. So then when he was taken up into heaven, yes, in the fourth and fifth, sixth chapters, he saw the heavenly throne, he saw Jesus Christ as the mediator holding the scroll, then he saw the sixth chapter open up as the breaking of the seal started. But keep in mind, this whole beast system has not yet been explained because down on earth it had not even been developed. That's what we've got to understand. I want to show you, brothers and sisters, exactly how precise it is to the Bible. In the 17th chapter, there's an angel. This is none other than Christ in angelic form. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. Now the angel is saying to John, he's up there. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, and brothers and sisters, Catholicism had not even, even come in existence in 96 A.D., had it. But John is put into the future tense of time when he could see it. And I have to say this. John was put into the future tense right when the head of that eagle and the revelation of it is being imputed down here on earth. Now, I've had people to say, well, Brother Jackson, why do you use 19 and 63? Because, brothers and sisters, it's the only time that the revelation of six seals ever even occurred. Amen. Nowhere back down two times had they even been touched. Amen. They was carried in the prophetic scriptures and the analysis of the writings. Nobody knew what they meant or anything. They was only symbols. But in 19 and 63... That's when God had a living instrument on earth. And then His Spirit in heaven begins 
through that prophetic realm. Because there's a prophet on earth that he's going to speak to. So now, I, I would like for us all to just put ourselves in John's place. He's in heaven. He's in the future tense. And I have to say, the future tense is just not anywhere. There's a precise place in future tense. And the angel says, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. Now the whore had not even come into existence yet. But here he's being seen something or another. So he's way over here when it's done, even been, it's done, been materialized. That sitteth upon many waters. Now this whore, we will say, is none other than Catholicism. But now don't let no Catholic person take offense at that. Because here we come to the denominational side. Because brothers and sisters on down here, it speaks of this woman to being the mother of many harlots. Well, what are these harlots? It's these denominational systems that the Reformation period brought out, but each move would only go so far. And then when the people that really was beneficial to it, the rest of it, brother, it died away. They're still alive today. They got religion, but they're just as bad off in their shape as Catholics are in their shape. Now then, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And it's at that time, Catholicism hadn't come into existence. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So now that tells me, brothers and sisters, that at the time that John in heaven was seeing this, this whole European system coming from 96 AD has already grew through time and produced its many images. And it's over here, brothers and sisters, it's a dress having seven heads and ten horns. How many realize that? He's looking at it over here because he's up in the heaven in the spirit realm. He's in the future tense. He's not back there in 96 AD as he was a prisoner. <clears throat> and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones. And I will say this morning, we've been in the Vatican. If you would go to the Vatican Museum and Library, you can see the very things that's described here. The, the elements of gold that has been sent to this system through the years by royalties, golden cups, all kinds of artifacts is in the library and museum. It, it, it's, a, it's hard for me to describe the wealth as you look upon all of this. And yet I have to say, brothers and sisters, there's not one ounce of spirituality in it at all. When you read the scripture, brothers and sisters, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, he was not born in a time when Judaism contained all the wealth and the glory and the pomp of her hour. Those things do not, brothers and sisters, build spirituality. But to the carnal mind, yes, they measure success by that of material wealth. So she's arrayed in color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of... Notice, not the mother of virgins, Mother of harlots. So who are these harlots? That's your denominational systems that the Reformation brought out. It was beneficial for the first few decades to get the spiritual ones out. But then after we will say, we come into this 20th century and the message of the hour came, then to give people an opportunity to come to really to what is the bride truth, brothers and sisters, 
we see where then these systems begin to die. And that's why today, brothers and sisters, they've died, they've slid back, and they went back, a lot of it, and back into the world. That's, right. that's why you can't teach them nothing. All right? <clears throat> and so I said, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, because it goes to show she had back in the ages prior to this, she had been the one that had condemned thousands upon thousands of Holy Ghost people to death. And I, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, he seen how John looked at that. He saw that beautiful looking woman. I want to say this. And I want to use my own way of description. If she was admired by world dictators, she looked like a 20th century nightclub celebrity. You have seen pictures of them. How they'll have on these long gowns with the breast half shown and the back is bare and the legs split so they can be seen. But oh, look how beautifully she looks all attired, stripped down like this. She's a nightclub celebrity of a dance hall. She was made to look just what the world would go after. That's why she's described like this. Now, it's the angel that tells John. So now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you tonight, I mean this morning. The angel is telling John, and don't you look back on earth in 96 AD. John is up here in the spirit. And the angel is escorting John through a process of time of development. There's no other prophecy in the Bible written like the book of Revelation. It's written like this strictly for the end time bride of Christ. So it says, come here, John. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now at that time, brothers and sisters, she's done had seven heads and she's done had ten horns. And now then, the angel is going to start describing the beast. And he starts out, he said, The beast that thou sawest, that puts it in the past tense, was past tense, and is not. So that put it in a period of time, brothers and sisters, when it was not yet restored to its original state. How many realize that? The angel is escorting him through time to explain this. <clears throat> so he says, the beast that thou sawest was, and I want to say this this morning, you hear these preachers talking about the United Nations. That is not the beast. It never was. It did not have its origin in Rome. It had its origination in New York and in the States by a bunch of politicians back 40 some or 60 some years ago. We are the nation that was the goose that laid that egg. And we got all of these other nations to join it. And now, brothers and sisters, up through that system has become a diabolic, dictatorial spirit that would like to absolutely, brothers and sisters, control every major nation within its domain. And I have to say, somewhere in front of us, God's going to hit that thing with a death stroke because that cannot take the place of Scripture's. Because the beast that we look for in this day is not something other that just originated 60 years ago. It was a beast that was somewhere in time. But it was injured, it was wounded unto death. So don't tell me it's United Nations, it's not. So he says, <clears throat> So the beast that was, and yet there was a period of time that it wasn't. What was that period of time referring to? The time of the Reformation. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, meaning, when that head of that papacy was wounded, then that dictatorial, dominating, powerful spirit of Satan that used that little horn in that system, it died. It went off of the scene. It went back down into hell. It made it look to the world like that beast was no longer alive. 
And that's why, brothers and sisters, the beast has remained more or less, we will say, lifeless. But it was, was not, and yet it is. Potentially, it's going to be the same thing. That's why the angel describes it like this. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Because the end of it, brothers and sisters, is over here when the Lord comes, when that beast and all the nations of the earth will be assembled together to make war against him that sits on the white horse. Jesus will absolutely bind that spirit of that thing and cast that spirit into the lake of fire. He kills the physical side, but the spirit of it, brothers and sisters, goes into the lake of fire. With that in mind then, <clears throat> and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, that means in the period of time when it does come back into existence to play its last day role. Now the angel is going to give them wisdom. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which this woman sitteth. That's number one. You know and I know that that woman is Roman Catholicism. But where is her seat of authority? It's in Rome. Her capital is not in Paris, Berlin. It's in Rome. That's why she come up during the power of the ancient Caesars. And the gradual system became gradually changed. So the angel is describing to John, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sat. Now, it's a twofold meaning. 10, verse 10. And there are seven kings. So now that he's not talking about mountains, he's talking about kings. And I want to say this, brothers and sisters. I have read in this history, from the death of Nero, which occurred in 69 A.D. There's been many men that sat in the imperial palace, looked upon as emperor, Caesars, this and this and that. But keep in mind, not all of these men played the important prophetic role. Some were, we will say, transitional men. How many knows what I mean by transition? They fulfilled a gap, a span of time. They linked time together with the ending of this and the beginning of this. But they were them themselves not even considered as that important. So now as I read this part here, then I'm going to show it to you from the Bible. And there are seven kings. The angel is giving you a description Five are fallen. So now that puts it in the past. So the angel is standing over here looking down the past. Five are done fallen. And what is? Now then, the angel was pointing at the time of Constant, Constantine. He's the one, brothers and sisters, that we talked about last Sunday that had the vision. He was going out to engage some of these, these territories that was trying to break away. He saw the sign of the cross, and he took it that, was the, that the God of the Christian was telling him, if he will accept the sign of the cross and put it on the shields, they will be conquerors and victorious. Constantine was the sixth head. Now, I've had men to say, well, Brother Jackson, there was other kings before Constantine. You're not listening to what I'm saying. Because if you would read the history... Between the time that the fire had fallen and Constantine, it says the Roman Empire fell into decline. And it just went a tumbling. Nothing but upheavals and political chaos. Constantine was a man that was able to take over the reins and regain stability. Please, brothers and sisters, please. Some people go to ch school. They just read words and come out of there with an F because they didn't see a thing. When I read history, I read it for what it says. 
And I read every word to see how it fits into the future and everything. So don't think I'm trying to put something over your eyes. I'm not. I'm going to show you from this Bible and this history how they coincide exactly together. And how we're living in the day. That what the history wrote back then, the Bible shows it coming back. <clears throat> All right? <clears throat> and what is? So that's Constantine. And the other has not yet come. So he's talking about a head, another king, isn't he? And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast. Now when he talks about this, is he talking about a big physical thing? He's talking about the spirit that will make the beast be what it's supposed to be. That was, so it was one time was. And is not. Even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. That's at the coming of Christ. Now I have to say, brothers and sisters, John was standing over here where you and I are in time standing. And the Spirit of the Lord has inspired him to tell John, this is the way to look at this thing. Now, if you will bear with me a little bit, I want to show you, brothers and sisters, how this history, written back in 1917, was copyrighted. They don't even use it in schools no more. Because a lot in here, brothers and sisters, they haven't time to even study it. Let me, let me read you what the, the writer said. During Nero's reign... Half of Rome was laid in ashes by a great fire, which raged for a week. But a new Rome speedily arose. It was a much finer city than the old, with wide streets instead of narrow alleys, and with houses of good stone in place of wooden hovels. Except for the loss of the temples and the public buildings, the fire was a blessing in disguise. After the death of Nero in 69 A.D., the dynasty that traced its descent from Julius and Augustus became extinct, meaning no more kinward Caesars, uncle to nephew, father to son. How many realize that? There was no one who could legally claim the vacant throne. The Senate, which in theory had the appointment of a successor, was too weak to exercise its powers. The Imperial Guard and the legions on the frontiers placed their own candidates in the field. The Roman world fell into anarchy, and it became once more the seat of civil war. The throne was finally seized by the able, the able general Flavius Vespasian, he was the one that was engaged in tearing the city of Jerusalem and conquering the Jews in 69 AD. Now I go to Josephus, the Jewish historian. He had fought the Romans in the early period, but when he began to realize it was a it was a loss, he began to meditate how he would absolutely get out of this. So when the day came then, brothers and sisters, that Fabian, Flavius Vespasian broke through the outer walls, was penetrating into the city. The Jewish historian, Josephus, he decided to surrender. And God inspired him with a prophecy. It's written in his writings. As he came out of his quarters and approached this, this Roman general, he said these words, O Vespasian, knowest thou not, this day thou shalt be emperor in Rome, 
And Vespasian thought he was trying to flatter him. But in a short order of time, a messenger came. Was a message from the Roman Senate. Telling Vespasian, return to Rome and take the position of the emperor. Because Nero is dead and there's no kindred to put it, so you're to take over. So from then on, brothers and sisters, Josephus, when he too was captured and taken by the Romans, he was given, we will say, freedom, recognition in Rome. That's how he was successfully able to, to complete and write his whole entire history as he did. Now with this in mind, during the reign of Aspasian, it tells about the Jews, so we'll skip that. When we leave Vespasian's hour, he dies. Then his son Titus. Then from Titus's hour, it's Domitian. Then from his hour, he dies. This brings us now, brothers and sisters, to the year 180. When it says in the book of Revelation, five are fallen, wonder who the angel was pointing to. Wonder what he meant. He wasn't talking about Nero. He was not talking about Vespasian. He was not talking about Titus nor Domitian. It's the men that came on and took the position. And they're referred to in history. The five good emperors. Listen to them. The five rulers. Nerva. Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. And it comes down to here and tells you all from the natural carnal side they did. It called them the good emperors. They built schools. They built big arenas of entertainment. They did their level best to try to pull the Roman Empire together. When the last one of them died, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> the Roman Empire, it fell into chaos. So I'm hoping you'll understand, brothers and sisters, as I've read here, where the angel is saying, five are fallen. That's when the five good emperors had had their period. When they did, the Roman Empire fell into chaos. And as he did, brothers and sisters, there was nothing but political upheavals all the while. Then we come to Constantine's hour. Now it's after 12 o'clock. And I'm going to quit this morning. But the Lord's willing, I want to finish this tonight. Because I have to say, brothers and sisters, there's people living out there that's hearing what I'm saying. And they probably think that I'm just rattling my mouth. I'm not. I'm giving you history that can back it up 100%. And it carries you right straight on through. So may the Lord, but Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, take these words and use them, Lord. Put the picture together for your people to see that we're living in the days, Lord, when this thing is coming about again. You're restoring it back for that short period of time. But then, Lord, the prophetic picture will be complete. So help us, Lord, as your people to learn and to be your people ready to live and walk with you in the light of truth. I thank you for every brother, every sister. Lord, bless them today. Keep us true to you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless every one of you, brothers and sisters. I will say this. My wife is feeling much better. She was able yesterday to, for the first time now than she had had in a few days, she was able to go to the dirty clothes and sort out certain clothes and take them to the washer and put them in the washer and turned it on and then she puts them in the dryer and then she takes them out and she folds them up and puts them where they belong. So, <clears throat> But <clears throat> she finds this place where they put that thing at, a little tender there, getting tight clothes on, but I think maybe she should be, be ready to be with us about Thursday. So may the Lord bless all of you. All right. <clears throat>